Sí. Sí. Perfecto. Sí. Sí. Perfecto. Sí. Well, a very good morning and good afternoon to everyone who has joined us. And welcome to the virtual launch of the Pan American Health Organizational Regional Status Report on Preventing and Responding to Violence Against Children 2020. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Mary Lou Valdez, the Deputy Director of the Pan American Health Organization. Over to you. Senora Valdez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hennis. Good morning, everyone. Her Excellency Maria Julia Ruiz, First Lady of Colombia, the Honorable Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, State Minister in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Jamaica, Dr. Josefina Luna, Na Advisor of the National Council for Children and Adolescents, Dominican Republic. Ms. Claudia Uribe, Director, Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Car Caribbean, UNESCO. Dr. Howard Taylor, Executive Director, Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Mr. Yosef Abdel Jalil, Deputy Regional Director, Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean, UNICEF. Honorable guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, PAHO colleagues. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the Pan American Health Organization's seminal regional status report on preventing and responding to violence against children in the Americas 2020. Today is truly a milestone. This report is the first of its kind in the region and it could not have come at a more opportune time. The COVID pandemic has created a new urgency for action on violence against children. The pandemic has led to an increased risk of violence in the home, while the resulting disruption in health and protection services has severely limited access to violence prevention and response. The numbers are dire. The region of the Americas has the highest homicide rate for children under age 18 in the world, more than three times the global average. Boys are particularly affected with homicide rates almost four times the global rate. Homicide rates among girls in the Americas are also exceedingly high almost double the global rates. And while these figures are shocking, they do not describe completely the scale of human suffering. 58% of children ages two to 17 years in Latin America are estimated to have experienced some form of violence in the past year. Violence against children and adolescents takes many forms. We must reflect on the tragic experience of the two-year-old growing up in a violent household, the child being bullied by classmates, the adolescent boy who is recruited into a gang, and the adolescent girl, girl who is sexually harassed and even abused or raped. All of these forms of violence are unacceptable and must be stopped. Today, we wanna to talk about solutions. We have seen time and time again that violence can be prevented and its consequences can be mitigated. 
Paho is proud to be one of the co-authors of Inspire, a multi-partner framework that includes strategies for preventing and reducing violence against children that are based on the best available evidence. The regional status report launched today describes achievements and challenges in line with the Inspire framework. It draws on data from 31 countries led by the national data coordinators, working in close collaboration with multiple sectors of government, non-governmental organizations, civil society, and other partners. It is important to note that our region is not starting from zero. For example, 73% of countries report assistance for response and support services at the national level, such as essential child protection and health programs. Similarly, 76% of countries support violence prevention approaches that provide children with support violence prevention that provide children with education and life skills, such as anti-bullying in schools. Together, we can learn from these experiences to build an even stronger evidence base. The report also signals a clear need in all countries to sustain progress and focus needed attention to the implementation and effectiveness of approaches. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development emphasizes the goal of ending all forms of violence against all children. The Regional Status Report warns of major, of major equity gaps. For example, while more than 90% of the countries indicate having clinical services for survivors of sexual violence, only 26% report that these services reach all or nearly all children that are in need. We must work together to address and close these enormous gaps. In closing, I wanna focus on three key messages. The first is that we are at a critical junction and it is only with strong leadership and political commitment that we will attain the necessary changes to ensure that all children and adolescents can live long and healthy lives free of violence. We must sustain the achievements highlighted in the report while at the same time working to strengthen their effectiveness and reach. Secondly, even as we continue to be challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic and its health and social economic impacts, we must not lose sight of realizing our vision of a world free from violence with our children at the core. We must work together to address the needs of survivors in a comprehensive and coordinated manner, working towards achieving equity to ensure that no one is left behind. And thirdly, effective prevention and response efforts rely on strong partnerships across government sectors, with civil society, and with a diverse range of partners. We will achieve more together than apart. And that's why we are so pleased today to have representatives from different sectors of government and our partner organizations. The report clearly benefited from the inputs and advice of many. I would like to recognize the excellent work carried out by our national data coordinators, their counterparts, as well as the significant collaboration with our partners. PAHO stands ready to work hand in hand with all of you to convene stakeholders, foster necessary dialogue, raise the visibility of this topic, and advance the report's recommendations for sustainable action. The great Nelson Mandela once said, the true character of a society is revealed in how it treats its children. Together, we can make health for all and freedom from violence a reality for our children and for the region of the Americas. 
On behalf of all of us at PAHO, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Oprah. Thank you so much, Mrs. Valdez. And thank you so much for that phrase that sums it all up. The true character of a society is revealed in how it treats its children. On that note, the voices of children, adolescents and youth are critical to violence prevention and its response. Children are not passive recipients of support. Rather, they can guide and lead effective responses to violence by providing unique insights on what works in practice. PAHO created a Youth for Health group in 2019 with representatives of young people from across the region in order to give youth a voice and ensure that they are involved in solutions that aim to improve their health and well-being. We invited some of these youth to send in short video contributions which we will now play. And at the end of the panel discussion, we do it as well. I want to thank Maria Fernanda Fino Blanco, Cantuta Conde, Ayushi Nandalal, Divya Nandalal for their contributions to this event. Let's hear from some of them now. Les hago llegar un cordial hayaya desde el altiplano boliviano. La violencia que viven las juventudes, niños y niñas indígenas, es fruto de la historia colonial y racismo enraizado en nuestras sociedades. El despojo de nuestras tierras, la prohibición de nuestras lenguas, la discriminación, la falta de acceso a la justicia y la exclusión hacen la violencia que sufren los pueblos indígenas, cuyas principales víctimas son las juventudes, niños y niñas indígenas. Esta violencia tiene efectos en la salud física, espiritual y mental, exponiéndonos a la pérdida de nuestra identidad, bajo autoestima, depresión, abuso de alcohol, autolesiones y el suicidio. De los casos de violencia sexual contra mujeres indígenas, un gran número de víctimas son niñas indígenas. Aún más grave es la falta de acceso a la justicia que deja estos crímenes en la impunidad. La cruel pandemia ha ahondado la violencia contra las juventudes. Sin embargo, las y los jóvenes somos resilientes. I believe that there should be no excuse for youth violence and that there shouldn't even be a debate as to whether it is important or not. It is important. A child should be able to have the happy childhood surrounded by individuals who love and support them. Distinguidos participantes, les invito a considerar dos acciones para superar la violencia. Primero, la participación. La Agenda 2030 y el Objetivo de Desarrollo Sostenible tiene como principio no dejar a nadie atrás. Esto exige que las y los jóvenes, niños y niñas, participen en todas las decisiones que afecten sus derechos. La participación significa escuchar nuestras aspiraciones y demandas, y juntos encontrar las soluciones. Segundo, el cambio institucional. Los estados garantizando los derechos fundamentales de las niñas y niños y juventudes deben crear mecanismos específicos que velen por nuestros derechos. En el contexto de pueblos indígenas, esta tarea será en coordinación con las autoridades tradicionales. Reunir datos sobre violencia y acceso a la salud que incorpore la autoidentificación étnica y cultural en zonas urbanas tanto como rurales y en edades y género. Esto nos permitirá formular con datos una respuesta eficaz. Someone once said that strong people stand up for themselves, but stronger people stand up for others. Those who are victims of youth violence may find it difficult when it comes to speaking about their problems. As a result, they should be encouraged by either educational or religious institutions to talk to someone they trust. Hotlines can also be introduced to show them that they are not alone and that there is someone who is willing to help. Schools can also encourage students to attend interactive programs that speak on youth violence. Students who have been exposed to these programs may also be inclined to help others in similar situations as they grow older. 
They may be able to advocate and teach others about this topic and ensure that others do not suffer. Good. Okay. Seems to be didn't, didn't, didn't come off. So this report would not have been possible without the collaboration of country representatives across the region and our partner organizations. So we're delighted that we're joined today by six distinguished speakers who will help us to unpack the relevance of this regional status report for the Americas and identify some concrete next steps for the region. So let's meet our panelists now. Let me introduce with great pleasure her Excellency, Senora Maria Juliana Ruiz, First Lady of Colombia. Welcome, Your Excellency. The Honorable Miss Juliette Cuthbert Flynn, State Minister in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Jamaica. Dr. Josefina Luna, Advisor, National Council for Children and Adolescents of the Dominican Republic. Miss Claudia Uribe, Director, Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Caribbean of UNESCO. Dr. Howard Taylor, Executive Director, Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, welcome. Mr. Yusuf Abdel Jalil, Deputy Regional Director, Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean of UNICEF, welcome. So welcome and many thanks to all of you for your support, not only at this event that launches the report, but also in the development of the report. I'd like to remind all speakers to please keep answers to three minutes as a maximum so that we can do several rounds of questions and answers and have full engagement. So the first area is why is this topic or report important? We know that violence against children can take many different forms in the region, all of which lead to severe health consequences from death to injury. It is clear that preventing and responding to violence is a public health priority. So I want to start this conversation with Honorable Minister Cuthbert Flynn. Minister Cuthbert Flynn, from your perspective as State Minister of the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Jamaica, why is this regional status report and the topic of the report, violence against children, important to Jamaica? So over to you, Minister. Pleasant morning to everyone. Um, it is really a pleasure for me to present um, at this regional We see a number of um, things happening even here in Jamaica um, during this time of COVID-19, uh, more violence against our children. And so anything that we can do as a country, we are definitely willing to assist. But and commend PAHO on this movement. As the first publication of the, its kind in the Americas, the report provides a timely update on the region's progress in preventing children. We know that the evaluation was conducted against the INSPIRE framework, and we applaud PAHO for this, the achievements of Sustainable Development Gold goal SDG 16.2 uh, to end abuse, trafficking, and all forms of violence and torture against children. We are very pleased that the report also focused on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on children. Jamaica notes from the report that much progress has been made in the area of this is good news, um, even as Jamaica moves forward with the implementation of the national response to children and violence. Approximately a year ago, Jamaica launched its um, five-year national plan of action 
for an integrated response to children and violence uh, with the main goal to create an of the of and response on the issues of violence, child abuse, and maltreatment of children in Jamaica. This means that for the first time, Jamaica has a comprehensive intersectorial response to in the broader context. Uh, this national plan is ex is intended to assist Jamaica in fulfilling its obligations as pathfinder country under the global partnership to end violence against children. And this global partnership designates charged with the commitment of three to five years of fast tracked action to end violence against children. Jamaica is the only pathfinder country in the Caribbean committed to these um, three, three to five year of fast track action to prevent and reduce violence against our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Cuthbert Flynn. Um, we are grateful to have different subregions represented in this panel. And I now want to move to the Dominican Republic. Dr. Luna, why is this report and its topic relevant for the Dominican Republic? Hola, buenos días. Muy contento de estar eh, y participar en este foro. Eh, sin duda que para República Dominicana el haber participado eh, en, en esta encuesta y sobre todo tener los resultados directamente para nuestro país ha sido de mucha importancia justo en este momento en donde estamos eh, desarrollando una nueva gestión en el Consejo Nacional para la Niñez y la Adolescencia, que es, el, es el, la organización que coordina el sistema de protección. Hay cuatro puntos que yo quiero destacar de este informe y es que re, realmente nos revela al país de nuestras fortalezas y nuestros desafíos para la gobernanza en lo que tiene que ver con la respuesta a la atención a la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes y sobre todo eh, la, la prevención. Un punto que destaco como médico, como pediatra, es que estas recomendaciones y estas estrategias están basadas en evidencias. Muchas veces hemos tenido intervenciones que las repetimos, sin embargo, lo que nos ofrece el informe y, y Inspire, eh, sin duda que están basadas en evidencia y esto nos da mucha importancia y, y, y mucha fe en de que va a resultar. Otro tema también que, que a nosotros nos ha resultado de este informe es que refuerza el diagnóstico o la necesidad que ya nosotros habíamos identificado de fortalecer el sistema de protección y sobre todo fortalecer la coordinación interinstitucional de todas aquellas eh, organizaciones e eh, instituciones tanto gubernamental como no gubernamental, que tienen que dar respuesta a la violencia, la necesidad de la mejora del dato, porque ciertamente en los resultados hemos tenido eh, eh, buenos resultados en algunos aspectos, sin embargo, puntualizo la necesidad de que nosotros como país tengamos eh, resultados y datos que sean confiables para próximas intervenciones. Eh, también eh, el resultado y el informe eh, a nuestro país nos eh, garantiza que estrategias que hemos venido desarrollando de una manera tímida, como por ejemplo el apoyo económico a las familias, pues estas estrategias debemos de fortalecerla, asimismo como el apoyo que ofrecemos a la familia de los niños, niñas, adolescentes que están eh, afectados por la violencia. Otro tema eh, que nos desafía es el abordaje que tenemos para los adolescentes y los niños agresores y víctimas o uh, veedores de violencia. Tenemos alta tasa de violencia de género, entonces es un desafío para el sistema poder a, a, a actuar eh, para que estos niños eh, que han visibilizado violencia en su entorno familiar, y sobre todo en la relación de pareja, puedan tener intervenciones que sean efectivas. Así que agradecida por la oportunidad de eh, ofrecer estas palabras y, y, y felicitar a OPS sin duda porque necesitamos este, que el sector salud se involucre de una manera activa eh, en, en el abordaje de la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes. Gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Luna. 
Of course, the consequences of violence against children go far beyond health and include a range of socioeconomic costs, which calls for a whole of government and whole of society engagement. Let me now turn to the First Lady of Colombia. Your Excellency, Senora Maria Juliana Ruiz. Why is this report and its topic important for social mobilization to prevent violence against children in Colombia? Over to your Excellency. Good morning, special greetings to everybody. Un saludo de verdad muy especial a la Organización Mundial para la Salud, la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, a UNICEF, a los panelistas y por supuesto a nuestro moderador. Definitivamente creo que no cabe duda, eh, incluso a partir de ese informe, que todos los países de nuestra región tienen esa prioridad de la defensa y la protección integral de nuestros niños, niñas, adolescentes y jóvenes. Y hay algo fundamental para mí en este informe y es que nos aporta de manera significativa algo extraordinario que se llama conocimiento, data real y puntual para nosotros tomar decisiones como naciones absolutamente acertadas y oportunas. También me gustaría destacar que eh, toda esta eh, respuesta que nos da el informe está enmarcada por el contexto de Inspire, que ha sido algo que Colombia ha sabido y ha querido adoptar con rigor. Y todo esto además nos permite de alguna manera muy eficiente adelantar acciones a partir de las lecciones aprendidas y reconocer algunos de esos desafíos que aún persisten en la región. Y eso es justamente lo que nos da la posibilidad de tomar decisiones, de fijar estrategias y de definir acciones concretas para la prevención y la atención de esas violencias desafortunadas contra la niñez y la adolescencia y la juventud en nuestros países. Para contestar puntualmente esta pregunta, quiero además contarles en el caso de Colombia y bajo el liderazgo del presidente Iván Duque, algo fundamental, y es que desde que inició el gobierno hemos tenido una premisa de trabajo multisectorial desde el sector público, el sector privado, la cooperación internacional y es la cero tolerancia a cualquier forma de violencia hacia la infancia, la adolescencia y la juventud. Y hoy, dos años después, esta es una causa nacional. Como bien lo exponía eh, nuestra digna representante de, de la juventud, indígena de Bolivia realmente, si no convertimos estos propósitos en causas nacionales que tengan una mira no solamente al, a la inmediatez, sino a una agenda de largo plazo, va a ser difícil que avancemos con la eficiencia y la prontitud que, que necesitamos. Hay algo que es definitivo y es que todos conocemos el efecto devastador de la violencia en el capital humano y es que definitivamente estas experiencias adversas en la infancia generan efectos devastadores, en, eh, no solamente eh, lo físico, sino en la salud mental, eh, en toda esa capacidad de ser y estar fortalecidos en cuerpo y alma. Conocemos cómo muchas de estas acciones eh, impactan en enfermedades eh, crónicas, eh, eh, la, la desafortunada intención de los jóvenes o de niños de caer en situaciones como el alcoholismo, la drogadicción, eh, prácticas sexuales no seguras. Y lo que tenemos es que hacer ese llamado y esa conciencia de un trabajo colaborativo, propositivo y solidario. Es lo que he hecho desde el rol que me corresponde. Fui eh, designada como embajadora nacional de buena voluntad para el ODS 17 con ese objetivo y es el de prevenir la violencia contra nuestros niños, niños y adolescentes y romper definitivamente con esos ciclos lamentables que se perpetúan muchas veces en conductas que tristemente se normalizan en nuestras sociedades. Y quiero puntualizar en cosas muy concretas, acciones que hemos desarrollado en Colombia bajo esa alianza nacional contra la violencia a niños, niños y adolescentes y están enmarcadas por un trabajo absolutamente coordinado, nación, territorio. Nosotros tenemos más de 32 departamentos, cerca de 1.103 municipios 
y trabajamos de manera absolutamente articulada en esa relación del trabajo de la nación y lo que sucede en el territorio, en las entidades locales. Hemos desarrollado un trabajo muy puntual con eh, la gestión social, articulado con la gestión social. Hemos adoptado, como les dije, el modelo INSPIRE. Hemos eh, proporcionado una capacidad realmente articuladora en el trabajo intersectorial y algo que me parece necesario que, que conozcan es que por primera vez en Colombia el año pasado se presentó la primera encuesta nacional de violencia contra niños, niñas y adolescentes y a partir de ella también pudimos trabajar bajo la experiencia. Y otra cosa que para mí en lo personal es fundamental y es no desconocer esas secuelas, esos daños que quedan más allá de lo físico, de lo que podemos ver, y es ese dolor, ese daño y ese perjuicio que se causa en la salud mental y emocional de los ciudadanos. Así es que a partir de eso hemos trabajado en algo que ha resultado tremendamente valioso para el país, que es capacitar, proveer por primera vez una certificación para la crianza amorosa a partir del juego. Y son todas esas herramientas que realmente nos permiten articular desde la familia, los docentes, la institucionalidad, el sector público y el sector privado en un mismo propósito. Y en la normatividad quisiera también que supieran que hemos avanzado con ímpetu y algo que quisiera reconocer es que estamos a un debate de aprobar el proyecto de ley que busca prohibir el castigo físico, tratos crueles contra menores de edad. Esa es una, definitivamente una esperanza, al igual que lo hemos venido avanzando en términos de normatividad contra aquellos que perpetúen actos de violencia severa o abusos sexuales a menores. Entonces, una vez más, simplemente creo que este eh, trabajo que se hace con el informe es absolutamente revelador y nos permite una movilización eh, social adecuada y una comprensión necesaria para los pasos a seguir. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for sharing these multisectoral approaches and concrete actions in Colombia to tackle violence against youth. Now, a major question is, what can we do about it? One of the most shocking figures in the recent status report is a child homicide Dr. rate. Dr. Hennis, you want to unmute. I am actually Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. Thank you. I think there's a delay when I unmute and when you can hear me, unfortunately. Thanks. So one of the most shocking figures in the regional status report is a child homicide rate. The region of the Americas has the highest homicide rate in the world with more than 15,000 children killed in the year 2017. Child and youth homicide is a shared concern by PAHO and UNICEF. Mr. Abdel Jalil, what other data do we have on child homicide and what can we do about this absolutely awful problem? Over to you. Well, thank you very much and good morning or late morning and good afternoon, depending uh, on where you are, and it's a pleasure to be part of this important panel. And in relating to the question, let me start with the compelling data of the imperative to put an end to children and adolescent homicides in the region. As you all probably know, and this has been also uh, highlighted uh, by Mary Lou Valdez, our region had and still has the highest homicide rate in the world, 19.6 per 100,000 population in 2017. This is more than three times the global average of uh, 6.3 per 100,000. And sadly, when it comes to children, the region of the Americas has the highest homicide rate in the world, 5.8 per 100,000 in 2017, compared to the global average of 1.7 per 100,000. Homicide rates in, Americas, in the Americas are especially high among boys, 9.3 per 100,000 for boys compared to 2.1 for girls. But it is worth noting that the homicide rate for girls in the region of the Americas is still higher than the global average. Latin America and the Caribbean is the only region that has seen an increase in homicide rate among adolescents aged 10 to 19 since 2007. 
slightly less than 10% of the world adolescent live in the region, but nearly half of adolescent homicide in the world in 2015 occurred in the region of the Americas. Ethnic origin, uh, particularly adolescent boys, increases the risk of homicide. Let me share with you the sad fate of Raul, Vitoria, Antonio, and Carlos. Raul was killed at age 17 when he was escorting his girlfriend home. Police officers stopped the bus they were in, ordered them get to get off, and then beat and shot Raul. Victoria was 17 years old when her boyfriend shot her in the head as she nursed her baby boy in a hammock. Antonio was lynched at age 12 in a vacant lot near his home. And Carlos was sitting on the sidewalk talking to a cousin when he was murdered at the age of 17. The names, as you can imagine, are fictitious, but the stories are real. And from the state of Sierra in Brazil, uh, the profile of victims is well known. They are young, black, poor adolescent living in the outskirts of the city. In 2013, adolescent homicide in the state's capital skyrocketed to 141.1 1 .1 homicide per 100,000 adolescent. Given this scenario, there was a critical need to come up with resolute public action and policies to curb the violence and protect the children. Homicide is not only in the Northeast of Brazil, but it is also in Central American countries, in Colombia, in Jamaica, in Mexico, in all these countries, uh, UNICEF is working with partners to ensure protection for families that are victim of violence, control access and use of firearms and ammunition, promote access of education and life skills, including bad school program, promote inclusion in the formal job market, train police officers in child rights and positive engagement with children and adolescents, advocate for investigation and prosecution of homicide, support local government to identify cases of violence and respond effectively and, and timely, and reinforce community-based psychological support services. Violence, including homicide, is preventable and we must jointly act to end this crime. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, violence against children is not a new challenge for the Americas, but the COVID-19 pandemic has created new urgency for action. As risk factors for violence increase in the home, access to support for survivors of violence is also reduced at the same time, unfortunately. For example, Schools provide powerful protection against violence through providing education, building life skills, and identifying at-risk groups. However, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of children are still out of school in the region as the school year is coming to a close in many countries. Many are also spending more time online than before, both for schooling purposes and recreation. I want to turn to UNESCO now, which works close with the education sector. Ms. Uribe, has there been an increase in violence against children during this time? And how can school communities address it? Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación a participar en este importante evento. Para la UNESCO ha sido una oportunidad única el trabajar con otras agencias del Sistema de Naciones Unidas en la elaboración del informe global sobre violencia contra la niñez y acompañar a la OPS en el desglose de los datos regionales que presentan de manera clara la preocupante situación de nuestra región. La pandemia ha llevado a las autoridades sanitarias y educativas a decretar el cierre de la gran mayoría de escuelas en la región. En muchos países, este cierre se ha prolongado ya por más de ocho meses, lo que ha impactado el año escolar completo. Sabemos que para muchísimos niños, niñas y adolescentes, estar sin la posibilidad de ir al colegio trae problemas y riesgos importantes para ellos y para sus familias. La evidencia acumulada en estos meses nos muestra que las consecuencias negativas van más allá de las importantes pérdidas de aprendizajes, de la ausencia de procesos de socialización y de la falta de acceso a los servicios de salud y protección social que se brindan en el ámbito escolar. Estos efectos también contemplan el aumento en la violencia familiar, la violencia sexual y la violencia en línea, incluyendo el ciberbullying. 
los y las niñas están pasando muchísimo más tiempo en línea que antes de la pandemia y mucho de este tiempo están expuestas a este flagelo. Asimismo, vemos con preocupación el aumento de los embarazos infantiles que son por definición violaciones. A su vez, con las escuelas cerradas, es posible observar mayores niveles de estrés entre los padres, las madres y cuidadoras y con ello un número creciente de niños, niñas y adolescentes siendo víctimas de violencia doméstica, negligencia y abuso, incluida la violencia emocional, física y sexual. Como caso en El Salvador, el Ministerio de Salud informó que los embarazos en niñas menores de 14 años aumentaron 79% durante los meses de confinamiento más estricto entre abril y julio pasado. Al mismo tiempo, casi todos los países de la región han informado que debido a la pandemia, los servicios sociales como las líneas de ayuda para temas de violencia doméstica que normalmente responderían a estos casos se han visto interrumpidos. La capacidad de las comunidades escolares de enfrentar estas consecuencias, recibir a los niños que han sido víctimas o testigos de la violencia intrafamiliar y proporcionarles el apoyo que necesitan está en juego. Como cualquier problema social, los más vulnerables siempre cargan con los impactos más fuertes. Por ejemplo, los niños y las niñas que viven en zonas rurales, las personas con discapacidad o en situación de desplazamiento forzado. Al igual que las y los estudiantes que han experimentado interrupciones académicas, los sistemas educativos tendrán que redoblar sus esfuerzos conjuntos junto con los sectores de salud y protección social para identificar, apoyar y monitorear a estos y estas estudiantes cuando vuelvan a la escuela. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, señora Uribe. Now, um, the recent report highlights the many efforts that have been made in terms of violence prevention, while stressing the importance of sustaining and building on these achievements. Dr. Taylor, how can we continue to strengthen government commitments to end violence against children in all its forms? Thank you. Let me first just thank Paho and, and partners for bringing us together this morning for what I think is a very timely and a very important conversation. Uh, and secondly, to say hello, and it's great to hear and see friends among the speakers and to hear all the great examples of, of action already that have been given, but also uh, to say hi to everyone who is watching on YouTube or, or on Zoom. It's great to have everyone participating today. I want to speak very briefly to four things which I think that we can and should all do. Strengthening coordination and collaboration, that's the first. The second is scaling what works. Thirdly, making the case for investment. And fourth, sharing progress, because that's how we inform and inspire others to do more. So first of all, strengthening coordination and collaboration. As we heard from other speakers, including uh, Her Excellency, the First Lady of Colombia, coordination across many sectors is a critical ingredient uh, to end violence against children, given its complexity. And so there's no single actor, there's no single government agency uh, who alone can reduce violence against children. So what we have seen in the countries where there is good progress, including Colombia and others, is where there is a multi-sectoral coordination mechanism Sounds a bit of jargon, but it's a lot of bodies across government and beyond coming together, agreeing joint priorities, aligning their agendas, coordinating their action and mobilizing the human and the financial resources necessary to get the job done. So that coordination piece is critical. Secondly, scaling what works. So when there is an evidence-based plan in place, and I stress the evidence base and the criticality of local data to take what's the best practice globally with the, the data which shows what's going on nationally and locally, producing that evidence-based national plan, it is often necessary to boost the institutional capacity to make sure that the INSPIRE strategies can be effectively scaled. And that means doing so both vertically, which is through government and non-government agencies, but also horizontally, or put differently, geographically, expanding the geographical coverage of uh, programs that are known to be working. 
Thirdly, making the case for investment. It was really encouraging in responses to the survey for the Global Status Report that 81% of countries who responded noted they had at least one published action plan to end violence against children. However, uh, only around half of those plans were, were noted to be fully funded. So there's a gap between uh, commitment, planning and intention and the resources needed to get the job done. So all of us must make a better and more persuasive case for investment. Investing because investing to prevent violence against children is of course more cost effective than responding or their response mechanisms are of course vital. And we know that investing to end violence against children uh, is a multiple win because violence against children undermines all the other investments in their health, their nutrition, their education, their development, and it has direct costs for, for governments and others, which are often picked up over many years. So we need to make the case for investment. And the fourth area for action, I think, is sharing progress in the same way that we're doing this morning, because this is informational. I've already learned this morning. Uh, and it's also inspirational. It encourages others to do more. We have nine governments within the End Violence Partnership within the Americas who have all made what I think is a really bold political commitment. Beyond the commitment made through the SDGs, they've gone a step further and made a domestic, high-level, public political commitment to do all they can to end violence against children by 2030. Brazil, Canada, Colombia, El Salvador, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Paraguay, and Peru. But let's get the others on board. But in the meantime, we from the End Violence Partnership will do what we can to work with and support all of those countries who are pathfinders within the End Violence Partnership. And we will share your learning, your evidence base, your success, because learning what works and sharing that is, as I say, how we can best inform and inspire others to step up and take action. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Much appreciated. Now, this report stresses the need for strong multi-sectoral mechanisms and the importance of a national system for the protection of all children. Dr. Luna, can you tell us a bit more about the role of the national system for the protection of children in the Dominican Republic and how you're working with others to strengthen access to the needed prevention and response services. Sí, gracias. Mire, el Consejo Nacional para la Niñez y la Adolescencia, quien, eh, quien preside el sistema de protección eh, de los derechos de niños, niñas y adolescentes en República Dominicana, es quien eh, promulga, quien formula programas políticas para la protección integral de los niños, niñas, adolescentes. Está conformado por varias instituciones, tanto gubernamentales como no gubernamentales, en la que puedo destacar la, la presencia del de Ministerio de Salud Pública, el Servicio Nacional de Salud, el Ministerio de Educación, la Procuraduría General de la República y, y, y otras más instituciones que tienen que ver y que dar respuesta eh, a la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes. Ha sido una experiencia y un gran desafío el poder trabajar de manera eh, intersectorial e interinstitucional para en efecto dar respuesta a la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes. Ya nuestros anteriores eh, expositores han estado eh, planteando que el abordaje de la violencia y la prevención de la violencia requiere de la intervención de distintos sectores. Entonces, eh, el, el, el CONANI, el Consejo Nacional para la Niñez y la Adolescencia, a, a, aglutina estas instituciones para dar respuesta. Eh, nosotros eh, reciente, bueno, en el 2015 eh, eh, se publicó la hoja de ruta para la prevención y erradicación de la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes. Eh, fue un marco eh, y de hecho eh, planteamos eh, prolongar su vigencia y fue un marco que le permitió al país eh, dar directrices a las distintas instituciones que tienen que ver con el tema para el abordaje de la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes. Actualmente eh, estamos también presidiendo el recién gabinete creado de políticas de niñez y adolescencia y estamos inmersos en el diseño de planes para la prevención del embarazo en la adolescencia, eh, sobre todo temprana, vinculada con el abuso sexual, planes para la reducción del matrimonio infantil. Asimismo, eh, estamos eh, inmersos en el diseño de una ley para la, la prohibición del castigo físico. De manera que el Consejo Nacional para la Niñez y la Adolescencia eh, asume estos compromisos y es quien impulsa 
que estos eh, desafíos se puedan establecer a nivel país, eh, colaborando con las distintas instituciones y trabajando de la mano con las distintas instituciones que tienen que dar respuesta eh, para proteger los derechos de nuestros niños, niñas, adolescentes. Así que yo agradezco nuevamente esta oportunidad de que nos han ofrecido para compartir con ustedes la experiencia que como país hemos tenido en el abordaje de la violencia contra niños, niñas, adolescentes y eh, posibilemente, y bueno, eh, es uno, una de las deseos, es que podamos ir eh, in, estableciendo el eh, eh, INSPIRE, ir uh, dis, eh, organizando nuestra respuesta a partir de la propuesta que hace INSPIRE en estos, eh, para el abordaje de la violencia de una manera integral y sobre todo basada en evidencia. Gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Luna. Now, when children have experienced violence, they must be identified as soon as possible and provided with urgent help. The health sector has a critical role to play in ensuring access to health services, something which this report flags as a major area for action in the region of the Americas. Minister Cuthbert Flynn, can you please give us an example of what Jamaica is doing to strengthen health and protection services for children who have experienced violence. Minister Cuthbert Finn of Jamaica. Okay, there may be a technical issue. So I will move on and come back to Minister Flynn. Okay, as the regional status report highlights, many countries are addressing school-based violence, including bullying. Senora Uribe, what are some of the main elements of successful programs to prevent school-based violence? And how can we ensure that the needs of even the most vulnerable children are addressed in their design and implementation. Señora Uribe. Sí, gracias. Bueno, la respuesta del sector de educación frente a cualquier problema complejo tiene que tener varios componentes. Estos componentes se pueden resumir en cinco elementos básicos. El primero, las políticas, que tanto a nivel nacional como a nivel de establecimientos deben nombrar y describir las violencias que ocurren en el ámbito escolar y que expresen la inas, inaceptabilidad de ellas en cualquier circunstancia. Sabemos, por ejemplo, que solo con el hecho de contar con una política escolar explícita a nivel de establecimiento educativo que nombra y denuncia la violencia racista o homofóbica es un factor protector importante. En segundo lugar, la sensibilización y la formación de los docentes y de todos los adultos que trabajan en los colegios siendo fundamental para que puedan reconocer y actuar frente a las violencias. Sabemos que los docentes y los otros adultos que trabajan en las escuelas son frecuentemente testigos de situaciones muy difíciles para los niños en el aula, en los pasillos, en el recreo y en los espacios virtuales asociados a la vida escolar. Si no, si no toman acciones firmes y coherentes, contando con el apoyo del resto de sus comunidades escolares, es posible que no se tomen las acciones necesarias a, pe a pesar de sus profundas preocupaciones. Este silencio termina siendo otra forma de violencia contra los y las niñas. Tercero, no es solamente cuestión de abordar lo que pasa en el día a día en el colegio, sino cómo educar para prevenir las mismas actitudes y prejuicios que están en la base de los actos de violencia física, psicológica y social. Aquí enfatizamos en el propósito de la educación a través de sus contenidos, materiales, estrategias pedagógicas que se puedan usar para instalar el respeto y la solidaridad como principios básicos de la convivencia en el colegio y en la sociedad. 
En este sentido, las comunidades educativas pueden trabajar con muchos actores sociales para reforzar estos mensajes y estrategias. Actores como sociedad civil, autoridades de protección social, academia, asociaciones de familias, por ejemplo. Finalmente, es importante poder medir tanto la escala del problema como el impacto de las acciones para así prevenir y combatir la violencia escolar. En este sentido, los sistemas de monitoreo de denuncias, respuestas y del impacto de la efectividad de programas son de gran importancia. Si no, no podremos saber qué funciona y qué se tiene que ajustar. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, señora Uribe. Um, let us see if you can connect with Jamaica again. Um, Minister Cuthbert um, Flynn, are you able to hear us? Okay, I'm not seeing a response. Okay, well, let's go on then to, um, to UNICEF. Beyond schools, we know that mothers, fathers, and caregivers play a critical role in both INSPIRE and the regional status report that both underline the need to work with and support parents and caregivers. Mr. Abdel Jalil, given UNICEF's work in this area, what are some of the examples of successful programs in the region from which we can learn? Thank you. Let me start with the parenting. The evidence is clear, high quality, positive parenting is crucial for children's well-being, development and safety. This is especially true for the earlier year. In the first 1,000 days of life, uh, from conception to age three, a child's brain develops faster that, than any other time. Consider this, a three-year-old's brain is twice as active as that of an adult. The connection their brain makes are the building blocks for their future. Nonetheless, this whole process does not occur in isolation. It takes place in response to the quality of interaction experiences with parents and other primary caregivers who are critical in facilitating meaningful exchanges with other people, places, and objects in the environment. However, the child is impacted negatively if the family environment is adverse because caregivers lack the necessary skills, resources, and guidance to raise and protect their children adequately and care for their own mental and physical and emotional well-being. This is especially critical in the context of exclusion, crisis, emergency, the human mobility and institutional fragility, which is why additional support and assistance measures are required. Also supporting and empowering fathers and mothers to achieve better outcome for children is a high priority at UNICEF, not only for parents of young children, but parents of adolescents. Research shows that parenting program offering support and advice to parents with adolescents can also yield very positive results. The sustainable development goals highlight the importance of investing in early childhood development and protecting youth, uh, youth or young children from all forms of violence and is also reflected in UNICEF regional framework on violence and early childhood for Latin America and the Caribbean, which we developed in 2017. Given that violence against young children compromises early childhood development, it constitutes a clear threat to the exercise and effective enjoyment of their right, and also for the accumulation of human capital uh, to which the First Lady of Colombia has rightly and eloquently referred. Uh, and this is due to the fact that the cognitive capital accumulated in the early life is affected negatively uh, by, by uh, you know, all the abuse in that, in, the, in that level. And so the foundation of, human, of lifetime human capital is altered. And you know human capital is key for sustainable development. UNICEF and PAHO and WHO Care for Child Development Intervention has shown promising opportunity for reaching, supporting, empowering, and building parenting skills of family, improving children's nutritional status, growth, and development uh, outcome, and also reducing uh, violence against children and maternal depression. The benefit of this care and uh, childhood development through home visit and parenting courses in addressing uh, postpartum depression are now clearly documented. See, uh, this care and childhood development in LAC includes a specific module uh, of, on violence prevention that has been already implemented in many countries in the region, Belize, 
El Salvador, Paraguay, Peru, Dominican Republic, Panama, Nicaragua, among others with promising results. Uh, I would like to highlight only a few. In the case of Belize, for example, uh, UNICEF together with uh, Youth Enhancement Services have been promoting these parenting skills of adolescent moms, supporting them with positive parenting skill while still enduring or ensuring that they are that they as adolescents also receive much needed protection services and second chance education. Through this intervention, adolescent mom have supported other uh, adolescent moms. Also, UNICEF Jamaica recently signed a partnership agreement with the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, a government institute that provides educational and psychosocial support to adolescent mothers. Through this partnership, an evidence-based informed parenting program will be tailored to the specific needs of adolescent mothers and geared toward achieving improved child protection and development outcome. The program will also uh, seek to engage fathers and the parents of adolescent mother, i.e. the grandparent, through separate parenting sessions. Early moment matter and positive nonviolent parenting matters for children of all ages. That's why the right food, stimulation and care, or eat, play, love are essential. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Abdel Jalil. Now, um, in violence prevention, we talk a lot about partnerships across sectors and stake with stakeholders, with communities themselves. Dr. Taylor, how can we continue to expand collaboration in the Americas? Thank you. Yeah, I want to say just two things this time around. The first is around sharing learning and growing the evidence base. And I think we've already heard quite a richness about that on today's, on today's call. So I won't um, elaborate the point too much, but I think uh, that there's an agenda to promote Inspire as a globally recognized uh, best practice strategies for ending violence against children. And Inspire is live or it's alive. It's constantly being improved and informed by all the work of partners on this call and many others around the world. So it's constantly learning, constantly improving uh, with the latest best practice. And I would just note in passing, I think the, the experience of the last few months during the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course we're not yet out of, has also been a critical agenda about learning in real time um, about how to keep children safe during COVID-19 when children's environments, whether it was home, online, at school, in communities, all came together in some ways. Uh, and I think we collectively, uh, as a global community, have really learned a lot through that. And that's also been informing the development of the evidence base. I know that UNICEF is going to be convening some, some conferences in the region. I think the first one is going to be hosted in partnership with the government of Colombia. Uh, and that's an a great opportunity for, for governments and other actors uh, across the Americas to have regional and sub-regional dialogue to share lessons learned in the context of the Americas while also bringing in uh, what's appropriate and useful from the global experience. Uh, and then of just course in that agenda of learning and uh, growing the evidence base, we must make sure that we're looking at the data, the national data, whether it's the violence against children surveys or admin data or national other national surveys, and making sure that we are measuring and that we are monitoring uh, and tracking progress and making sure that too is being documented, evaluated uh, and disseminated. And that's a role that we as an end violence partnership will continue to play through the end violence knowledge network and the knowledge platform. The second thing I wanted to mention is a forthcoming opportunity for us all, uh, the Together to End Violence Solution Summit series. Just over two years ago, we held a solution summit in Stockholm in Sweden, bringing together almost 450 uh, leaders from across sectors. The first time that many actors across many sectors have come together with a shared purpose of ending violence against children. This time around, because of the pandemic, we're going to be doing it virtually. Uh, but I want to issue an invitation to everybody on today's call to be part of that Solution Summit series because it's an opportunity for us all. It's an opportunity, it's a platform uh, to raise awareness, to share solutions and to catalyze the political and financial commitments which are so necessary to end violence against children by 2030. So the summit series will start with a leaders event, a high level launch event on the 15th of December. Uh, and we will bring together government leaders, royalty, Nobel laureates, UN heads of agencies, children and young people, of course, playing a critical role, faith leaders and others from every continent. And they're gonna be aligning behind a shared vision of a world without violence against children, but also with a clear call to action 
uh, of what it takes to make that vision a reality. So do join us on the 15th of December. But after that, there's going to be five or six months of affiliate events around the world. They can be in countries, they can be uh, across borders on issues of mutual interest, and they can be global. And the idea of the affiliate events is that's where the really detailed work is done to share solutions that are contextual and appropriate locally and nationally, but also uh, for communities of advocates and others in countries and beyond to advocate for what they know is, is politically possible and feasible and necessary to happen in any given country. And then at the end of the series around next summer, there will be a high level leaders event where culmination will come through and people will be making commitments, political and financial commitments to job done and to get the job done. And what we really hope uh, through people across the world, because one of the advantages this time with the Solutions Summit, there are many disadvantages of the pandemic. One advantage of working virtually is that many more people in many more countries across many more sectors can be involved in the summit series. And together we can share the solutions and, and, and catalyze the commitments that will accelerate progress to end all violence against children by 2030, whether that's keeping children safe at home, at school, online, and in their communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Violence prevention and response benefits from the collaboration of an advocacy by diverse actors. Your Excellency, Senora Maria Juliana Ruiz, you've been an advocate for the prevention of violence against children in Colombia as well as in your collaboration with other First Ladies of the region. What is the role of a First Lady in fostering a comprehensive approach to violence against children in the home? Can you give us any examples? Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Lo primero que tendría que decir es, es algo que es eh, muy humano. Y es que las primeras damas asumimos este rol sin postularnos ni haber sido elegidas de manera directa, eh, de manera generalizada, sin presupuestos ni equipos de trabajo definido. Pero lo hacemos con la certeza de que vale la pena trabajar por y para los demás y de que nuestra gestión genera de por sí un impacto social positivo que es visible en el bienestar de los ciudadanos. En mi caso concreto, cuando asumí el rol, me propuse conectar al país a través de las primeras damas, de los gestores sociales, de los caballeros, de todos aquellos que en nuestro país asumen ese rol de liderar la gestión social. Y a hoy hemos logrado integrar una red de tejido social, LUNA, que traduce Líderes Unidos por los Niños, Niñas, Adolescentes de Colombia, donde trabajamos con las gestoras sociales, caballeros y, y todos los líderes articuladores de la gestión social en el país en 1,103 territorios, y lo hemos hecho con un trabajo continuo atendiendo ese primer llamado que les comentaba que se hizo a nivel nacional de la cero tolerancia a cualquier forma de abuso, maltrato o violencia contra nuestros niños, adolescentes y jóvenes, y algunas cosas muy puntuales que son fundamentales en ese rol de, de convocar y de tener la vocería en un tema concreto y es que hemos logrado mantener canales de comunicación fluidos a través de mesas regionales en donde compartimos experiencias exitosas desde la nación hasta el territorio. Hemos podido generar una capacidad instalada en el 100% de los municipios en ese programa que les conté y en esa certificación de crianza amorosa más juego como una herramienta absolutamente útil y vital para prevenir la violencia en entornos familiares o educativos. Y además hemos avanzado en la elaboración de unos planes eh, territoriales en prevención de violencia con todas las gestoras sociales de los departamentos de Colombia. Esto es importantísimo porque esto realmente articula el trabajo que se hace en la nación con el trabajo que se hace en el territorio. Y lo hacemos desde la gestión social atrayendo e involucrando, por supuesto, el sector público, alineándonos y proponiendo de manera activa eh, acciones e incluso propuestas a nivel normativo, como les mencionaba antes. Y, y por eso es que creo tan importante hacer en esta oportunidad una invitación a las primeras damas de la región a que adopten en sus países las alianzas nacionales contra la violencia.
Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to allow each speaker to make a very brief closing statement reflecting on the following question. And we allow each person one minute. And the question is, what must we do next together in the region of the Americas to end violence for all children by 2030? Your Excellency, Senora Maria Juliana Ruiz, I will ask you to respond to this question first of all. So over to you, Your Excellency. Uh, I think you're muted, unfortunately. Okay. Can you hear me now? Definitivamente, desde mi perspectiva y desde mi rol, nuevamente el llamado sería a que las primeras damas lideremos desde nuestra capacidad de convocatoria y vocería ese poder articulador multisectorial para ese propósito de romper de una vez por todas esos ciclos de violencia en nuestros países que, como bien sabemos, son prevenibles. Pongamos nuestra cuota en la prevención y en la interrupción de esos ciclos de violencia. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for that. Now I'm going to ask Dr. Josefina Luna to respond to the same question. What must we do together in the region of the Americas to end violence for all children by 2030. You have one minute. Thank you so much. Sí, yo quiero destacar eh, la posibilidad de que podamos eh, trabajar eh, desde la región con estas iniciativas y estos programas que eh, se vienen desarrollando ya desde hace un buen tiempo que están dirigidos a poner fin a la violencia. La verdad que yo celebro el que podamos trabajar desde América Latina eh, con estos enfoques. Yo quiero destacar también eh, la importancia del compromiso político y en este momento nosotros estamos eh, con un nuevo eh, mandato eh, de gobierno en donde hay un gran interés eh, político para eh, proteger a la niñez y la adolescencia y sobre todo poder trabajar de una manera efectiva contra la violencia contra niños, niñas y adolescentes. Entiendo también que el recurso humano es muy importante. Eh, por fortuna, en República Dominicana hay un grupo de profesionales, mujeres y hombres, que están muy comprometidos eh, para proteger a la niñez y la adolescencia eh, del país y también destacar la necesidad y el apoyo de, la, de las agencias internacionales, como lo hemos estado recibiendo desde hace años de la OPS, de la UNICEF y de UNPA, para que eh, en efecto el país pueda continuar eh, utilizando estos recursos y estos apoyos tanto económico como técnico para en efecto eh, tener, eh, lograr lo que hemos deseado que es poner fin a, a la violencia contra los niños, niñas y adolescentes. Me parece y celebro eh, esta reunión y sobre todo el que finalmente América Latina esté involucrada en estas estrategias mundiales. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Luna. Now to Senora Claudia Uribe. Um, what must we do together in the region of the Americas to end violence for all children by 2030? Bueno, yo, yo diría que la estrategia Inspire nos provee ya una potente hoja de ruta para abordar este flagelo. Yo llamaría a que todos los países la eleven a los más altos niveles de, de decisión para adoptarla y para llevarla a la acción de manera intersectorial, participativa y colaborativa. Gracias. Thank you so much. Now, we, let's just see if we can bring the minister from Jamaica on board, Minister um, Cuthbert. So the question really is, um, what must we do together in the region of the Americas to end violence for all children by 2030? So Minister Cuthbert, um, Flynn, over to you. Let's see if we can get you on board this time. Um, so thank you. My apologies. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, please go ahead.
Yeah, we just heard you, Minister Flynn. Let's try again. It looks like the gremlin has struck again. Um, let us pose that question to um, Dr. Taylor, and then we try to follow up Dr. Um, Minister Flynn at the end. So Dr. Taylor, let's see if you can ask you to reflect on what we're doing together to end violence for all children in the Americas by 2030. Thanks, Anselm. Uh, I'll keep my response really short. I think there's an A, B, C. Uh, the A is for ambition. Let's be ambitious in our vision. Let's be ambitious in our vision to build back a safer world from children out of the COVID-19 pandemic to get to ending violence by 2030. The B is be bold. Let's be bold in our actions. And the C is B is collaborative. Let's collaborate. Let's be collaborative in our approach. Share what works and be honest and share when things don't work and encourage one another as we go forward. So ABC, be ambitious, be bold, be collaborative. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Let us then try to move on then to Mr. Abdel Jalil. Same question. What Thank you. Please go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Let me just make sure. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Claudia that we have a, a very uh, strong framework in Inspire that we should, which is really the sum of good practices that we should really use as a basis for our, our action. The other thing I would say is that violence against children is complex, multifaceted, uh, and uh, it also uh, uh, has some implication with inequality uh, in this region. So I think changing also norms is one of the most important area we should focus on. And another area that I think we should continue to do is build alliances, national alliances, international alliances, community alliances, uh, in order uh, to fight uh, this major uh, uh, challenge. So those I think are areas that we can focus on uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Oh, there's um, Minister Flynn. Can we see if we can try to, to try you again, Minister? Good. Well, let me go quickly again. Um, thanks once again, and um, sorry for the interruption, but I think working together is very important. I think region, and so for us to work together to find common solutions. But Jamaica, um, we definitely are working to end the violence against children. Um, violence against children is never something that is accepted. And by participating in today's launch, um, I'm reiterating its commitment to continue even more purposefully um, the work to protect our children from violence. Um, I think some of the things that we can um, is the need for more information and data to inform um, uh, policy and action. I think we need to definitely create safer environments for our children. Uh, more intervention, I think, is required in schools. Um, now that you know we have COVID, that's possibly going to be a, a little bit difficult. I think we can come up with some solutions to eliminate um, the culture of violence also is definitely um, something that must be worked on. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you for persisting as part of the various... Um, thanks again for um, having us participate. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to all panelists. Really appreciate your excellent inputs. Now we're going to move then to a video with voices from the youth from the region. Violencia es violencia, véase como se vea, vea ya dirigida a quien vaya dirigida, y especialmente en este caso a los niños y adolescentes. Es vital para nosotros como sociedad prevenirla, evitarla, frenarla, que no se esparza, que no se replique, ya que pues nosotros los niños y los adolescentes somos el presente y el futuro de cada una de nuestras sociedades, somos el presente y el futuro de Colombia, somos el presente y el futuro del mundo, somos el presente y el futuro... Pues para ir muy lejos, los adolescentes y los jóvenes representamos cerca del 20% de la población de las Américas, eso es un porcentaje relevante. More often than not, children are afraid to talk about what is happening to them, so this topic should be made easier to talk about, making children more comfortable with expressing their hardships. Extensive campaigns through television, 
through radio, through newspaper, billboards, and other media can be arranged to encourage these impressionable minds to speak up. Schools can hold programs about these sensitive topics to encourage parents to build a trusting relationship with their children, who will be more inclined to express their emotions. Me parece importantísimo que ese un acompañamiento más que todo pues dirigido por un ente gubernamental, también que se dé en el núcleo familiar, los padres, los hermanos, o sea, que todos estén involucrados en el crecimiento del niño, que no se dé en un ambiente hostil, que sea un ambiente en el que primen los derechos, en el que haya amor, en el que haya comprensión, en el que se pueden expresar libremente, tanto como dije, en el ambiente familiar, en el ambiente escolar, en otras instituciones extracurriculares, en el barrio, en la ciudad, es algo que es vital y que es un compromiso de todos. Nosotros como ciudadanos tenemos que tener la mente abierta, tenemos que tener la visión ampliada, no cerrada y no, eh, si no lo veo no pasa, no, tenemos que estar dispuestos a ayudar a los niños, a los adolescentes en el momento que lo necesiten, es algo que tiene que estar en coordinación, es algo que nos compete a todos como sociedad, como dije anteriormente, y que considero es vital que suceda. Children and adolescents are the future leaders of our country. They are the ones who will continue to shape society for the better or worse. Therefore, for societal, for cultural and economic progress, children must be protected at all costs. And thank you so much. And I don't think we could have said it any better than they did. In closing, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. Um, I will acknowledge Her Excellency, Senora Maria Juliana Ruiz, the First Lady of Colombia, the Honourable Miss Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, State Minister in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Jamaica, Dr. Josefina Luna, Advisor, National Council for Children and Adolescents, Dominican Republic, Senora Claudia Uribe, Director, Regional Bureau of Education, Latin America and the Caribbean of UNESCO, Dr. Howard Taylor, the Executive Director, Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, and Mr. Yusuf Abdel Jalil, Deputy Regional Director, Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean of UNICEF. I'd also like to rec um, recognize the participants, and we would like to recognize the significant contributions by the National Data Coordinators and their colleagues across sectors, the experts and all the partner organizations that contributed to this report on preventing responding to violence against children in the Americas. This report would not have been possible without your collaboration and commitment. This report should not be seen as a conclusion of a process, but rather as a seminal milestone with the goal of continuing to build on this baseline in coming years. Preventing and responding to violence against children in the region so that they may be able to enjoy long and healthy lives has never been timelier, nor more important as it is right now in the context of COVID-19. The Pan American Health Organization stands ready to work hand in hand with all of you to convene stakeholders, foster dialogue, raise the visibility of this topic, and advance the report recommendations in the region. Thank you to each and every one of you. Do have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.